It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Wednesday, November 7th, 2012. I'm James Burns, and yes, you're not dreaming. After one day of saying I was going on hiatus, I, well, I'm still going on hiatus. I'm still going to take a little break from Freedom Files, but I wanted to do a third-party elections result. Now, yesterday I said I wasn't going to do an elections result, which is technically true because I'm not really going to focus on Obama or Romney. They did have most of the votes, unfortunately, and uh, Obama won the popular vote by, what, about 2 million votes, and he uh, floored Romney in the electoral count, what, 300 and something to 200 and something. Anyways, I want to talk about the third-party election results because that's something that most of the mainstream media, probably 99.99% of them, are not discussing. Then afterwards, I want to talk about what I plan on doing with myself Uh, during my hiatus, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. All right, let's break down the election results. First off, let's go back in time to the year 2008. Of course, Obama got elected the first time in 2008 against McCain, but I also want to break down the third-party results from 2008 and then compare them with the 2012 third-party results. All right, the uh, big winner of the uh, third party results was Ralph Nader who ran as an independent. He got in 2008 738,720 votes. You know just over about well let's just round it off and say he got nearly 739,000 votes across the country for the independent uh, ticket. Then uh, in second place was Bob Barr who ran as a libertarian even though he's not a libertarian. He got only 523,713 votes. So, rounded off, we'll just say Bob Barr got about uh, 524,000 votes. Then, in third place was Pastor Chuck Baldwin from the Constitution Party. He got nearly 200,000 votes. The exact number is 199,437 votes. Then, in fourth place for third party votes in 2008 was Cynthia McKinney. She was the presidential candidate of the Green Party. She had 161,680 votes, and uh, that's the uh, vote count for 2008. Now let's move four years later to last night, uh, the 2012 presidential election, and Gary Johnson, libertarian presidential candidate, former governor of New Mexico, did rather well last night. Unfortunately, he did not get close to the uh, 5% a uh, popular vote that would have made the Libertarian Party recognized as a minor party instead of um, just an alternative party, which would have been uh, some more monies coming towards the uh, Libertarian Party's coffers. And, of course, at the same time, it would have got uh, better recognition from the people across the country. But anyways, he did rather well, way better than the uh, 2008 Libertarian candidate did. Gary Johnson got over a million votes. votes. He got 1.1 million votes. Just over that number. Very, very impressive. In second place was Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party. She got 396,684 votes. Comedian and actress and activist Roseanne Barr of the Peace and Freedom Party, she got 48,776,000 votes. Rocky Anderson of the Justice Party, the former mayor of Salt Lake City, he got 34,521 votes. And coming in last place for the top third party vote for uh, the 2012 presidential election was Virgil Good, former congressman out of Virginia. He was on the Constitution Party ticket. He only got 3,553 votes. Now, if we add up the numbers of Stein, Roseanne Barr, Rocky Anderson, Virgil Good, that number equals 483,534 votes, which is not even half of what Gary Johnson got. Bear in mind, Gary Johnson got over 1.1 million votes this election cycle, which was basically over 1% of the popular vote. So what we see here is two alternative parties on the rise throughout the country, the Libertarian Party and the Green Party. And we saw that uh, Monday night in the uh, second free and equal presidential debate hosted by freeandequal.org and RT, you had those two candidates. You had Gary Johnson versus Jill Stein in an excellent 90-minute debate, and they talked about a number of issues, and I did a review on that uh, for uh, 
Tuesday's podcast, which was supposed to be my last podcast for a while. But anyways, uh, back to uh, our discussion here. You have these two alternative parties on the rise. And there were many other elections, obviously, throughout the country. Uh, congressional elections, state, local elections. And there were Green Party candidates running throughout the country. There were Libertarian Party candidates running throughout the country. And in my congressional district, there was only two candidates on the ballot. The uh, incumbent, which is a Republican, and uh, a Libertarian candidate. Uh, Randall Lord, which I was hanging out with last night at his election party at uh, Al Basha, and uh, it's a Greek restaurant in Shreveport, and we were hanging out, just a couple of us, but uh, even though Randall Lord lost, he got into the ring, and by getting into the ring and, you know, manning up and, you know, putting on the gloves, he won, in my opinion, because he got 25% of the vote for the congressional race here in my district. So that's not bad for a third-party candidate. That's not bad for somebody on the Libertarian ticket. Now, personally, I would have liked to have a better number than that. I would have liked for, for it to have been a lot closer, and I would have really liked for Randall Lord to have you know, won, but that didn't happen. But the point is, Randall Lord did rather well as an alternative candidate, especially somebody who nobody really knew about in this congressional district and he got out there you know he he did the, he did it the old fashioned way he went door to door he canvassed and i think that that's a good sign because you have more people talking about the libertarian party now i know i know you have some other folks talking about third parties as well like chris matthews uh, calling all of us who vote third party idiots but see here's something that uh, chrissy doesn't realize most of the other countries that actually have an election system or somewhat of a system, democracy, parliamentary basis, they have a trans party uh, thing going on, which means that there's more than two parties in control. For example, in England, you have a, co a whole bunch of parties, but you have three predominant parties. You have the Tories, which is the conservative party. You have the Labour Party, and then you have the Liberal Democrat Party. Of course, you have others as well, like uh, UKIP, the... Uh, and a few others out there. The point is, they have trans party systems, and they have to form coalitions, and they have to actually work together for better or worse. And that's what we need here in this country. We need more parties in office. And that's one thing I applaud about the Libertarian Party and the Green Party and all the other alternative parties that actually had candidates running on the other ballots besides the White House. And that's one issue that I've had with the Libertarian Party for a while now, for the past couple of years, is that they always seem to only focus on the presidential race. But this time around, while yes, they did focus on uh, Gary Johnson, who was a big name and did rather well for a third party candidate, he did way better than all the other third party candidates combined vote wise. You also had plenty of Libertarians out there running from sea to shining sea. And I'm sure most of them lost, but at the same time, by getting in the ring, by getting in the fight, you know, you're showing people that the Libertarian Party is on the rise. In 2008, Bob Barr was only able to get us 523,713 votes. Four years later, Gary Johnson easily doubles that number with over 1.1 million votes. So that says something. Now, what does amaze me is the number from the Constitution Party. And, of course, I've never really been too big of a, a fan of the Constitution Party because I think the name is misleading. I mean, yes, they do follow the Constitution and Bill of Rights, but on top of the Bill of Rights and Constitution, they might as well be called the Christian Party because that's in their platform, and we've talked about that several times here on the podcast. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just very, very exclusive when you're basically a, a Christian party because then anyone else that might be interested in uh, joining your party that might not be Christian may feel kind of unwelcome in that party. But anyways, they have a right to believe what they want to believe, just like the Prohibition Party has a right to believe what they want to believe. I mean, and the Atheist Party as well. But here's something that I find kind of concerning for the Constitution Party's uh, continued existence. In 2008, with Pastor Chuck Baldwin, who I like, who I agree with on a lot of things, he got nearly 200,000 votes. Four years later, that number dropped dramatically from nearly 200,000 votes to just over 3,500 votes. So the Constitution Party is in serious trouble. 
Now, I don't know if that's the fault of their presidential candidate, former Congressman Virgil Good, or is it just the sign of the times and a lot of people that were once in the Constitution Party have gone elsewhere. But I would reach out to the members of the Constitution Party if I was you know, in the upper echelons of the Libertarian Party and try and, and bring them over. Because I think that's, that what, that's what needs to happen. Now, there's some, some things that the Libertarian Party and the Constitution Party do not agree on, but there's a lot of things that both parties do agree on. Like, for example, I think both follow the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Both could work there from the middle and bring in the Constitution Party and maybe build an, a stronger you know, alternative party that in four years could actually get 5% of the vote and therefore qualify to be a minor party, which would mean some money coming their way from uh, tax dollars, which wouldn't suck because the Republicans and Democrats get a whole bunch of that, unfortunately, and you know, start getting some victories locally, statewide, and even at the congressional level in the House and the Senate. Now, this is going to take a while to um, have it um, come to fruition, but what I see happening ever since uh, 2007 with the birth of the Ron Paul revolution is his ideas were, were seeds and they were planted back then. And I think they're just now beginning to start sprouting. Now you may actually see a, a more libertarian angle coming out of the Republican wing because they honestly believe that they were going to beat Obama last night and they thought it was going to be a lot closer than that. And, you know, Obama clearly won. He won the popular vote by 2 million votes. He won the electoral vote by what nearly what 100 or maybe more than 100 votes. That doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> but the point is, it's going to have a serious implication on the future of the GOP. They're going to have to ask themselves, why did we lose? Why didn't we do as well as we thought we were going to do? And that's going to have to make them go and have a serious come-to-Jesus moment. And in 2016, they better do something a little different. I think both parties need to. Both parties need to cater to libertarian ideas because the libertarian movement is on the rise. The alternative party movement is on the rise. And sooner rather than later, you're going to see a trans-party system in this country. The two-party puppet show is on notice. And that's one thing that I saw from last night's election that a lot more people are disenfranchised with the Republicans than the Democrats. And to make that point, I'm going to do something that I said I wasn't going to do at the beginning of the podcast, but it'll, it'll be worth it. In 2008, the popular vote between Obama and McCain, Obama had over 69 million votes. McCain had nearly 60 million votes. Four years later, Obama in 2012 won the election with just under 60 million votes, which is about the same number as John McCain. Mitt Romney came in second place with over 57 million votes. So there you see a drop in numbers right there. A lot of Americans chose not to vote on Election Day. A lot of Americans that did vote four years ago decided to stay home. They decided not to vote for anybody. They were so disenfranchised with Obama. And at the same time, they didn't really like Mitt Romney. They just didn't believe in him. So they decided, you know something, forget it. We're just going to stay home. We're not even going to go waste our time standing in the long lines to vote. We don't like either one of these clowns. And, of course, a number of those people that voted for either Republican or Democrat back in 2008 decided to vote for an alternative party candidate as well. So you had different people doing different things. A lot of people said no to 2012, none of the above, and then there were others that decided on an alternative. But you had the mass majority still of the country that actually votes, vote Republican or Democrat. But you can see that those numbers are going down, which is not a very good sign for the Republicans or Democrats in the long run. Now, since I um, basically have uh, made that announcement in the last podcast that I'm walking away from Freedom Files for a bit, I don't know how long, maybe uh, another week or maybe tomorrow I'll do another podcast and uh, say, no, I'm going on hey, this the next day. But anyways, what am I going to do? What, what am I uh, planning on uh, trying to achieve with my time off? And yesterday I spent a lot of the day after I went to go vote early in the morning 
thinking about my future and the future of this country and, and what needs to be done, you know, real solutions. And obviously, you and I don't have the ability to change things at the global level, even though things seem to get worse with the uh, continuing um, wars going on in the Middle East and other conflicts, as well as the uh, desperate economic situation and the possibility of a nuclear third world war always um, are on the horizon and um, a totalitarian one world government. Those are things we really don't have any control over. Unfortunately, we don't really seem to have much say over what happens in Washington either, even though we all hope for the best. We hope that Obama's second term will be a lot better than the first term, that things might actually start turning around, that Republicans and Democrats will stop acting like children and name-calling and blaming each other and start working together. That would be nice, but I, I seriously doubt it. So we really don't really have much control what happens there in Washington either. Where we do have the potential for making things better is at the local and state levels. Now, several laws passed throughout the country uh, yesterday, last night, that were good laws. Uh, I think there's a couple of same-sex marriage laws in a couple of states. A couple of, uh, uh, for example, in uh, Colorado and Washington, uh, marijuana has basically been legalized. And, of course, in Louisiana, uh, to our credit, we had uh, stronger pro-gun laws passed. Well, a stronger gun law passed, which you know reinforces our Second Amendment rights here in the Pelican State. And Louisiana, now a lot of people don't talk about Louisiana when it comes to gun rights, but we are a very pro-gun state, even more pro-gun than Texas, my home state. So, sorry, I have to call it like it is. We have open carry here. We, we're just more pro-Second Amendment in Louisiana than, we, than they are in Texas. That's just the way it is. I love both states. I consider both to be my home because... Louisiana is te technically my ancestral home because both sides of my family are from here. And I've lived here ever since I graduated from high school. So I consider Texas and Louisiana to be very near and dear to my heart. So because of that, because of my love for my two states, because of my love for my community and my area, that's where I'm going to be putting my focus on. I want to make a difference locally. I want to try and Find some way, I don't know how yet, I haven't figured that part out, that aspect, of making things better here. How can we do that? How can we go into the local area and improve things locally, uh, regionally, and, of course, statewide? Not just for me, but for all of you as well throughout the entire country. That's where I think we have to focus. Think local. Think about how we can work together, all of us that have you know teamed up over the years for various causes, whether it was uh, Ron Paul's 2008 or 2012 runs, uh, Campaign for Liberty, uh, the Tea Party Movement, Occupy, whatever various groups you belong to in the Fed, etc. What can we do locally to make a difference, to make an impact, besides trying to get good people elected to office at the local level and the state level, and eventually, of course, as I mentioned, the federal level? We can do some activism, of course. We can also get involved in the community. We can also uh, go out there, uh, volunteer, uh, do various projects, participate in, say, uh, soup kitchens, uh, donate to various organizations. So there's a lot of things I have to think about personally, and um, I'm going to get together with several other people that are fellow Ron Paul supporters, fellow libertarians that I've come to meet and know over the past couple years here in Northwest Louisiana. Uh, a lot of them I consider good friends. And I think it's time to start doing other things. It's time to start making other things happen and improving things where we can improve them. And of course with ourselves as well. And that's where you kind of have to start. And there are things that I like about myself. I've come a long ways on a lot of things. For example, when I was younger and dumber, I was a Kool-Aid drinking Republican. I always demonized Democrats and liberals because that's what Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity told me to do. And you know, I didn't really think for myself as much when I was in my late teens, early 20s. But I've evolved. I've come to think for myself and go out and do my own research and learn that we all have different opinions and views. Not all of us are conservative or libertarian or liberal or moderate. And that's 
just the way it is. That's what it means to be American. And that's one thing that was really sad about last night on Facebook. I saw a lot of people that I guess were Romney supporters. They were just out demonizing Obama and uh, everyone that voted for Obama. And I'm done doing that. I'm done attacking Romney supporters. I'm done attacking Obama supporters who voted for their various candidates. I'm done doing that. I'm done playing that little game. I want us to start working together. I want this divisiveness to stop. And I can't stop that at the national level. I can't stop that at the global level. But I can work locally to improve things. And if I fail, then what else is new? I'm pretty good at you know trying and failing at things. And I think most people are. And you can ask anyone that's been a success in their life. You know, They had their fair share of failures before they finally figured out their niche, figured out their place, and made the most of it. And that's what I'm still trying to do, and that's what a lot of you are still trying to accomplish. But I'm not going to give up, and just because I'm walking away from Freedom Files, cutting back on it, and I'll probably continue to do the podcast here and there, or maybe even a web show, I don't know. I'm, the future still um, is um, open for that possibility. But I'm going to go in other directions. Like I mentioned, there are things I like about myself. There are other things I don't. I've been eating healthier, at least trying to. I want to get back in shape. I've lost a couple pounds, but there's you know plenty more downstairs I'd like to drop. <laughs> I want to get a bit leaner and meaner as I used to be when I was a kid. I don't want to be like a scarecrow because I saw some photos my sister posted the other day of when we were kids. And uh, <laughs> I was a bony child. <laughs> but I'm just saying I want to get a little slimmer than I am right now. So, you know, I'm going to work on some things, you know, personal things, get myself improved in mentally, uh, physically, and of course, uh, health-wise, and even uh, spiritually. And I also want to focus on trying to uh, make things better at the local and state levels. Now, I do plan on one thing. I'm working on a, a letter for President Obama congratulating him on getting reelected, but at the same time, I'm going to encourage him on a couple of issues because in his speech last night, he talked about how he wanted to work with people. How I mean, it's something he's talked about for a while now over the past number of years, how he wants to reach out to Mitt Romney and Republicans and try and you know, get some things done. Now, I, I don't know if he's honest there. I don't know if he's just uh, empty words, but... I'm going to I'm going to put aside any doubt and I'm going to send him a letter and I'm going to tell him that look Mr. President there's also a growing number of libertarian Americans out there as well and I think it would be prudent of you to adopt some libertarian ideas such as uh following suit with what transpired in Colorado and Washington basically legalizing marijuana and that's just the beginning that's just the start of a, a nationwide marijuana legalization movement. They tried it in California in uh, 2010, but it, it failed. But they did manage to get it decriminalized in California. And Washington and Colorado is just the beginning. There's going to be plenty of other states that are going to be pushing for medical marijuana or decriminalizing marijuana or even making marijuana outright legal. And I say that it would be a wise decision by the president to get ahead of the curve on this one, pull back the DEA, and end drug prohibition. Because drug prohibition, while some people don't really think much about it, has been a disaster. It's been an utter failure in so many ways. It's costed countless lives. I mean, you see the carnage that's raged throughout Mexico because of the drug cartels. And, of course, on this side of the border as well with various gangs, MS-13, the Cribs, the Bloods, etc. And a lot of the, the motorcycle clubs are also involved in the drug trade. You know, much like with what happened during uh, the days of alcohol prohibition with uh, rum runners, gangsters like Al Capone, etc., it didn't work back then, so eventually they had to, you know, repeal that amendment. And we don't even have an amendment. We don't even have a constitutional amendment for the drug war. It's time to end it. It's time to end drug prohibition. It's time to pardon all the nonviolent drug offenders rotting in prison right now, costing us who knows how much, probably hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even billions of dollars a year just to house them 
Their only offense is they were caught with a substance that we deem to be illegal, whether it's marijuana, cocaine, heroin, etc. It's time to end the war on drugs. Now, I realize that there's some people that have a drug problem. There are some junkies out there, just like there's plenty of alcoholics out there with an alcohol problem. And there's support groups for that. There's, there's ways for people to get help with those issues. We shouldn't be incarcerating and punishing people who have drug problems. Now, I'm not talking about people that smoke marijuana. I'm talking about people that are hardcore junkies that all they do is snort crack all day and shoot up all day. And, you know, if you do that and you're responsible, that's one thing. But if your life is being completely ruined and utterly destroyed because of whatever substance you're partaking in, then you might need some help, whether it's alcohol or drugs. So that's, I think, the direction we need to go. And that's something Obama's even talked about before in the past. And he's even been outed as a guy that once upon a time, back in the day, partook in cannabis. Now, I personally don't smoke marijuana. I never have. I know that's a shock to all of you, especially those of you that are fans of my dad and his show, The Cannabis Corner. But at the same time, as somebody that respects individual rights and freedoms and liberties, I think that you should have the right to smoke marijuana. You have the right to drink alcohol as long as you're not putting anyone else in danger. You have the right to drink as much soda pop as your heart desires, eat as much fast food as your stomach can crave, and as much candy as your sweet tooth is uh, enticing you to have. We shouldn't be punished for decisions that affect us, you know, for better or worse, whether you decide to eat healthy or eat crap or, you know, drink nothing but water and herbal teas or become a hardcore uh, drinker that, you know, busts up your kidneys and liver and you end up dying at an early age like, unfortunately, my mom did. And coming up in a couple of days... A week or so from now is the 30th anniversary of, you know, when she passed away at the young age of 25. And, you know, and she, in her first marriage, was it was a very abusive marriage, and it drove her to uh, drinking very hard. But fortunately, she managed to get out of that marriage, and she met my dad. And But unfortunately, the damage was already done to her liver, because there's something I don't really talk much about. I do have a kind of a condition called fatty liver disorder, which means that my liver can't process alcohol as well as most people can, so I don't drink. I stay away from alcohol most of the time, 99% of the time. Every now and then I might have a little bit of wine if I'm in the mood, but for the most part, I, I do not uh, drink. I do not get involved in alcoholic products. Now, there was a time in my history years ago before I became a Ron Paul supporter where I considered myself to be a prohibitionist, where I actually was leaning that way towards making everything illegal that was bad for you. Now, I was wrong because that's me telling everyone else what to do with their life. In this letter I'm writing to Obama, I'm also going to advocate legalizing hemp in order to build up the hemp industry, which would create countless uh, made-in-the-U.S. products. It would uh, create a large number of jobs and businesses and an entirely new industry that could help uh, pull us out of this depression. So there's a, there's a couple things I'm going to send to the president in a very short, I'm, I'm going to leave it to one page. I'm not going to have a manifesto, Mr. President. It's going to be one page of some suggestions that I have as an American who happens to be a libertarian that, that might make the next four years of your president um, a lot more memorable by the American people than the past four. So hopefully the president and one of his staff members will read it and maybe it might make a, a light go off upstairs for the president. I don't know what's going to happen in that regard, but all I can do is try. So I'm at least going to do that. And then I'm going to clean my office, my studio, because it's kind of a mess. And that's how I'm going to focus my day one day at a time. Tomorrow I'm going to go look at this uh, new kitten that I'm going to adopt because, of course, as a lot of you know, a couple weeks ago my oldest cat uh, passed away from uh, advanced kidney failure. So I'm picking myself back up. I'm moving forward. Not meaning to uh, steal uh, the president's uh, slogan there. <laughs> but the point is, today's a new day and I'm heading towards the new horizon. Whatever that might be, I'm going to hope for the best plan for the worst, but try and do what I can locally to make a difference, and I think that's what you should do as well. 